Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the first live session of the Child and Family Focused CCBHC Learning Community, which is hosted by the CCBHC Expansion Grantee National Training and Technical Assistance Center. It was really a joint collaboration between the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, the National Association for State Mental Health Program Directors, and the University of Maryland Institute for Innovation and Implementation. So excited to see all of you coming in from so many different places across the country. My name is Samantha Holcomb. I'm a senior director at the National Council for Mental Wellbeing. I'm also the director of the CCDHCE National Training and Technical Assistance Center. If we can go to the next slide. Before we dive into our content today, just want to make sure you all have some grounding in what the TTA Center is, because we launched just this past December. We are funded by SAMHSA and really designed to support CCBHC expansion grantees and their partners in successfully implementing the CCBHC model criteria and adopting the evidence-based services and advancing implementation of activities and processes and partnerships that support expanded access to care for mental health and substance use. We go to the next slide. And then before we dive in today, we just wanna give you some context on the learning community itself. Some of this is covered in the first recorded webinar, which we highly encourage you to view within the learning management platform if you haven't already. Um, but why this learning community? I think there's many reasons for that. Um, as many of you are well aware, the CCDHC model is really spreading quickly across the country right now. And its purpose is really focused on expanding access to integrated and evidence-based mental health and substance use services. We also know that right now we're experiencing this elevated crisis in the mental health and well-being of our nation's youth. You know, mental health emergencies have increased across the board. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for people between the ages of 10 and 24 years old. And many youth still lack the access to the right support. Um, and, you know, thankfully, we've seen much of this highlighted in the president's priorities and mental health strategy in the past week. And then as this model spreads, uh, many CCBHCs are expanding their provision of services for young people and their families or establishing new services in this space. So while this is happening, um, this conglomerate of partners that we have who are so incredible and leaders in the field, we put our heads together and said, this is really an opportunity. And we wanna ensure that the evidence-based or best practices that currently exist within um, youth and families are what is being utilized and spread. And that the work of the providers happening across the country is happening alongside the systems in which they work. So that is really the purpose of this learning community. It's providing that space for making those connections, showcasing the best and evidence-based practices and pockets of success we're already seeing across the country that can and should be emulated. So if we go to the next slide, um, the last thing I'll just say before, you know, turning it over to those who are going to really be diving into the how and why today, it's just a reminder that today's event was made possible by SAMHSA's support of the CCBHC National Training and Technical Assistance Center, but the content doesn't necessarily represent the official views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA, or the Department of Health and Human Services. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Shira Piles, who is the founding partner of Human Service Collaborative and will be serving as today's moderator and resident subject matter expert. Um, thanks very much, Sam, and hello to everyone out there. Um, I think we can go right to the next slide. Um, these are our panel of presenters today. Uh, in addition to myself, we have Lisa Mancini was from a community, a, a certified community behavior, behavioral health center in New York State, and two reps from the New York State system. And I'll let them introduce themselves when they present later. Um, <clears throat> so next slide. Uh, thank you. As Sam said, we're, un, we're really focusing on how the broader child serving system environment um, has a bearing on core CCBHC functions, mm -hmm. and particularly in certain areas like screening and assessment, the service array, evidence-based programs, mobile response and stabilization, care coordination, and ensuring family and youth voice. And I'm gonna say, provide just a little bit of overview and context 
around these areas. And then we'll hear from Lisa about how they're customizing within their CCBHC. And then we'll have a little discussion with state partners on how they're supporting that kind of customization. The next slide, please. So as most of you probably know out there, um, children with behavioral health challenges um, are involved or at very high risk for involvement with multiple child serving systems. Um, not only are most children who rely on public systems Medicaid eligible, not all, but most, um, they, are, they may also be involved with the behavioral health system, mental health and or substance use, with the schools, with juvenile, obviously with schools, juvenile justice, child welfare, early childhood systems for younger children and intellectual and developmental disabilities. Public health may be playing a role, particularly for maternal and child health with home visiting programs, for example. And all of these systems are engaged in reforms that have a bearing on CCBHC core functions and create opportunities for CCBHCs. So understanding how these systems are organized at both state and local levels in your own states and creating partnerships with them is, is really key. Um, <clears throat> okay, next slide. Um, I'm gonna start by just talking about screening and assessment. So multiple child serving systems have responsibilities for screening, for example. The early and periodic screening diagnostic and treatment provision in Medicaid requires that Medicaid elig eligible children are screened and problems identified early and that they then have access to comprehensive and preventive services and states create periodicity schedules for screening. EPSDT screening is supposed to include mental health, behavioral health, vision, dental, medical needs, and uh, increasingly states are also looking at how to incorporate social determinants of health, um, adverse childhood experiences, et cetera, into screening. Some states require that their primary care practitioners who are the ones doing these screenings um, use standardized tools that, that um, allow for comprehensive screening, including of behavioral health. Massachusetts, for example. Um, <clears throat> in most child welfare systems, there are state standards. So this is in addition to Medicaid, child welfare. There are state standards that require that children entering care be screened for behavioral and physical health needs within specific timeframes. Juvenile justice systems you also have screening processes in place. The schools have screening in place and particularly for children involved in special education and Part C early intervention programs incorporate screening for very young children. So it's important for CCBHCs to understand the various ways children are screened for behavioral health needs. And, and then if we move to the next slide, what we're seeing and you're probably seeing in your own states as well, more states are moving toward use of common screening and assessment tools. Um, for example, the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths tools as one that support strength-based, culturally competent assessment that values, truly values family and youth voice, is trauma-informed and supports communication and decision-making across child-serving systems. And it's important that CCBHCs are aware of what these reform initiatives around screening and assessment are going on at state levels so that they have input into the tools that are being planned and or developed and that they're not, CCBHCs aren't going down some path that is uh, not in the same um, on, on the same path as these larger state reforms. Moving to the next slide, I'll move, I'm, I'm moving now from screening and assessment to the service array. As you may know, in May 2013, <clears throat> the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration issued a joint bulletin as, as a guide to state Medicaid directors on the services that should be included in a Medicaid benefit for children with mental health challenges. And that included intensive care coordination, specifically using a fidelity wraparound approach. Parent and youth peer support, intensive in-home services, respite, mobile crisis response and stabilization, 
flex funds, and trauma-informed systems and evidence-based practices. And I would really encourage you to look at that bulletin if you haven't, <clears throat> because it does provide important guidance, which many states are following, beginning to follow in terms of their benefit. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, besides Medicaid, any number of child serving systems are involved in ramping up, purchasing, funding, evidence-based practices for children and youth with behavioral health challenges. So we have, you know, EBPs that are supported by behavioral health and or Medicaid, such as Fidelity Wraparound. We have um, juvenile justice systems often ramping up multi-systemic therapy. There are a range of mental health and substance use evidence-based practices that state child welfare systems are now implementing as a result of the Family First Prevention Services Act, which for the first time will allow use of Title IV-E, which is an entitlement, to pay for uh, services that prevent children from entering care or for placement disruption, and, in, and specifically mentioned our mental health and substance use services. And then infant and early childhood EBPs in public health, such as parent-child interaction therapy, which also may be going on in child welfare. These again are all opportunities for CCBHCs. Um, and, and so having those partnerships, being aware of what's going on um, from that reform standpoint, just makes tremendous sense. Um, the next slide, please. CCBHCs are required to provide psychiatric rehab services. And for children and youth, those services tend to be intensive in-home services, therapeutic mentoring, skills training, treatment family homes or therapeutic foster care, which is a term that the field is trying to move away from to take away the notion that you have to be in foster care. Um, it is a treatment component on, in its own right um, for children who are also not involved in, in child welfare. Um, and the therapeutic components of residential treatment and therapeutic group homes and integrated co-occurring treatment, for example, for substance use and mental health. Often the psychiatric rehab definitions that states have, some of them are very old, um, they're generic and they apply to both adults and children. States are beginning to look at, some further along than others, at what are best practices for psychiatric rehab services? What does a community support program mean for a child as opposed to an adult? You know, so it, it, these are some, in some cases, being rewritten definitions. And again, CCBHCs need to be aware of these at the table and helping to craft definitions and understand what best practices are when it comes to this broad umbrella of psychiatric rehab. Okay, next slide, please. Um, mobile response and stabilization, there are newer generation models out there for children, designed just for children and adolescents. The crisis is defined by the parent or caregiver. Um, the, the, they're able to serve children and families in any environment, and they are specially trained child and adolescent staff. Um, if you go to the next slide, they are teams that can not only provide crisis intervention, but they can provide up to eight weeks of stabilization in the home, in the community, in school, including providing one-on-one -on -one crisis stabilizers. This is a model being implemented or, or already implemented in states like New Jersey, Oklahoma, Connecticut, Nevada is uh, implementing it, uh, ramping it up, and others. Um, and it's really important to, un to understand what is, if this is going, what is the mobile response and stabilization best practice for the child and youth population? Because we know a lot about this effectiveness of this model for reducing emergency room psych rehab, I'm sorry, um, uh, psychiatric residential treatment programs and, and, um, and also reducing placement disruption in child welfare and, and reducing school expulsions. So what, the oldest model of this in the country is wraparound Milwaukee. Um, and, and so other states are, are beginning to adapt that model. Okay, next, next slide, please. Um, 
I'm turning out a care coordination, so important. And the Maryland Institute did convene an expert group of both primary care and behavioral health child folks to look at, could you come up with a consensus around a care integration or care coordination continuum for children? They did. And if you go to the, what they said was it needs to be nested within common values and principles. And those are really system of care values, which you also see reflected in CCBHC language, frankly. Um, and that there should be access to family and peer support and navigators across the continuum and, measure, and, and metrics across the care coordination continuum. They recommended screening for all children that's comprehensive, looks at social determinants, obviously behavioral health, that states look at implementing child behavioral health consultation programs like the MCPAC program in Massachusetts, that there be team-based care coordination, even for children with mild to moderate needs. And for children with significant and complex needs, the only approach that they found that has evidence is intensive care coordination using Fidelity Wraparound. Um, so I share that with you. The next slide, please. So moving from care coordination to family and youth engagement, I just wanna say one other thing about it. Many states are, are ramping up on intensive care coordination using Fidelity Wraparound. And some are also introducing a moderate level intensive care coordination approach based on wraparound principles. And in some cases, they're building on community mental health centers to provide that. In other cases, they're, they're, they're actually um, contracting with what are called care management entities that, are, that don't provide other types of services. This is the New Jersey model, for example. Um, they only provide care coordination. So you really have to be attentive to what, what, are, what, what is the state doing and state Medicaid in particular in customizing care coordination for children with significant needs or at very high risk because you want to be in those discussions and understand how the system is being organized. Family and youth engagement, so critical across all the things I'm talking about. And there are lots of examples out there of, it isn't just about families as, and youth as peer providers, for example, but being involved at a policy level on CCBHC governing bodies, not just on advisory boards, but on governance structures. In man at management levels, being involved in quality review teams, being involved as trainers, being involved as pre presenters, um, as well as service delivery. So I'm going to, and I know I sort of, you know, went through that quickly, but I wanted to just provide that context setting before now turning over to Lisa um, to talk about her CCBHC and what they're doing. Great. Thanks, Sheila. I'm Lisa Mancini, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer um, here at Helio Health, and we are um, operating in upstate New York. Before I kind of dive into the CCBHC um, content, I just wanted to give a brief overview of um, Helio Health as an organization. Um, primarily, we're made up of four divisions. We have inpatient services, which include our detox and our short-term inpatient rehabilitation beds, um, outpatient services, which of course includes our certified community behavioral health clinic, as well as its satellites. Um, and we also have two opioid treatment programs, um, commonly referred to as methadone clinics, although we do provide um, all FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder. We have a, a pretty large residential division, um, and that includes treatment housing for both mental health and substance use disorder services at varying levels of intensity. We also have permanent housing for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. We have shelter plus care beds and also some affordable housing units that we operate as well and, and provide case management services to folks in those units. We have an in-community division, which includes our mobile treatment services. Um, in New York, um, there was an, a, an initiative called CODI, Center of Treatment Innovation. So we have a team of um, primarily peers that go out into the community, meet people where they're at, um, provide some, some pre-admission engagement services, and help people connect to the right level of care um, in their community that they need at that point in time. 
We also have some managed service contracts. We have staff that will be embedded in, in local jails or court systems or county DSS and provide some uh, chemical dependency and uh, mental health services in those arenas as well. And we have a recovery community center. We also operate a training institute, uh, primarily focused on behavioral health education. So we do trainings um, in New York for the KSAC, which is Credentialed Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Counselor, as well as Certified Peer Recovery Advocate. Um, within the past couple of years, we've had a lot of focus on mental health first aid. So we're doing both adult and youth mental health first aid right now for both our community um, and our in-house staff. Um, and we do a lot of continuing education hours for social workers, mental health counselors, and um, marriage and family therapists. So uh, many, many different clinical professions we're providing um, CEUs. And we operate in five per primary markets here in upstate New York. So I'm located in Syracuse, and that's where a lot of our services are um, here in the central region. But we also operate through the Finger Lakes region, Southern Tier, Mohawk Valley, and out into the Leatherstocking region, which is um, a little bit east, outreaching towards the Albany area. Looking at our continuum of care, um, we have over 1,300 beds that are currently in operation, and those include our inpatient beds and the residential beds that I talked about. And we have about another 153 that are in development right now that should be coming online this year. Um, and a lot of those are new projects that we have um, for a potential, you know, affordable housing, ESHI units, and some additional um, inpatient and residential beds. In terms of our agency's size, um, we actually are a little bit higher than that 837. I think we're at about 865 current employees right now. Um, and at full capacity, we would we'd be close to 1,000. Um, you know, as many other people in the community, we are struggling with um, some staff vacancies. So, you know, once we, once we can get up there, we're going to be about 1,000 employees here um, across the region. And as I mentioned, you know, we have some things in development um, and our growth is, is primarily constrained um, because of some of those staffing issues. Really, those are those are some of the reasons that um, may be constraining our growth and, you know, maybe some underperforming or underfunded programs um, in terms of the organization's overall growth. And in 2018, um, our organization rebranded. I, I did see some of my um, New York folks here on the call, so it's great to see you. Um, we were previously known as Syracuse Brickhouse or Syracuse Behavioral Healthcare, if you're familiar with that organization. Um, we just rebranded. There was no changes in um, structure or ownership, but we really wanted to rebrand as something that more represented our regional approach. Um, we were no longer operating just in Syracuse, so that was kind of confusing to some folks. So, and there's our website there on the bottom, and you can go to the next slide. So Helio Health was um, one of the original CCBHC's uh, demonstration programs in New York State. So we actually began operating as a CCBHC back in June of 2017. We had been operating an integrated clinic for adults for a few years prior to becoming a CCBHC, but we didn't offer child and adolescent clinic services prior to being a CCBHC. So that was a new service to us um, in 2017. So we had um, a lot to learn and we had some great folks on our team um, working with OMH and some folks in the community who've done this before. Um, we've also received a CCBHC expansion grant um, since that time and um, we've been able to enhance and strengthen some specific aspects of our services. So leading up to our program, the Child and Adolescent Clinic opening, um, like I said, we collaborated with some local partners. We worked very closely with a local hospital in our region, SUNY Upstate Medical University. Um, they had some children's mental health services and they had a large waiting list. So they really supported our opening. Um, they supported us with um, some consulta consultation from psychiatry. Um, and, and when we opened, we were able to take a lot of kids off the waiting list and really help some local community families. And shortly after we opened, um, our county-run mental health clinic began to wind down their services, and they ultimately closed at the end of 2017. So we worked with our county and their clinic director, and we were able to transition all of the kids that were in need of uh, continued services over to our CCBHC. And the need in this community was so much greater than we anticipated. Um, we served nearly double the amount of kids that we estimated that we could serve uh, in the first year of operation. So on the slide here, you'll see um, some of the services that we're able to offer through the CCBHC for the kids that we work with. Um, 
oftentimes myself and others here, we refer to the CCBHC as really offering a menu of services for people that come to us. Um, there's a lot of comprehensive things that offer. Not everybody needs all of them. Some come and they need just a few, but it really gives us the ability to tailor services to the individual that walks through our door. So that child and family, we can provide them, you know, the pieces of services that they need. And what they need when they come in the door may change a few months down the road. So we can add things on um, to their treatment plan, you know, at any point in time um, during their work with us. So on the slide here, you'll see um, the services that we provide. A lot of them are, are very common services that are provided, you know, in clinics, but um, we do comprehensive screening and assessments, um, crisis services, including community response for kids and families in need. So we provide um, crisis behavioral health care for kids that we serve at our clinic. Um, and then we also work very closely with the community mobile crisis team um, when they have kids in crisis to make sure that they're able to access services in a timely manner. We provide primary care screening and monitoring, psychiatric assessments and medication management, individual and group therapy, um, family services, certainly, play therapy, peer services. Um, we provide case management services for kids who are not already enrolled in a health home in New York State. And we have psychiatric rehabilitation services. And Sheila talked a little bit about that earlier and what those services entail and school-based mental health and substance use services. And for Helio, this has been an area that we have grown um, quite a bit in lately. We actually just last week on March 3rd received some operating certificates and we uh, are now open, We are now operating 18 um, satellite clinics of our CCBHC within schools in Onondaga County. So this has been a great way for us to be able to serve the community um, and all the kids that are receiving services through those satellite clinics will have access to the full array of CCBH services through the main program, which is amazing for them. Um, during the pandemic, I didn't want to talk too much about the pandemic because I know we've we've talked about that a lot for the past couple of years. Uh, but one challenge we had was with telehealth with the kids. Um, we did try. We did utilize a little bit of telehealth with the kids. We really had to assess each each child and their family about as to the appropriateness of it and their ability to use that. We piloted um, providing families with iPads and letting that if they didn't have technology at home to be able to participate. So we do have some some kids that are receiving services through telehealth, but um, we really needed to make sure we had a place that our kids could come to during the pandemic when they really needed those services. Next slide. So this slide here just shows a little bit about our growth. So as I mentioned, we started services in June of 2017. Um, that first year we served 275 kids. Or, I'm sorry, that first six months. Um, and I think that is basically what we anticipated that we would serve for the whole first year. So we really doubled that number of kids that we thought we were going to serve. Uh, we also saw a 40% increase in the number of kids that we saw um, just in 2021. So you can see in the previous years, we saw, you know, about maybe 10% or less um, increase year over year. But this past year um, during the pandemic, we saw a really large increase in the number of kids that we saw. Um, and I wanted to share with you today the video um, of an amazing young lady that we've had the privilege of serving over the past several years. Her name is Kendall, um, and she came to us as a teenager, and her resilience and determination has been uplifting to see. And she was willing to share with you her story in her own words. Um, so we're going to share that with you today. My name is Kendall. I'm 20 years old, but I was 16 when I started at the CNA clinic. Um, when I first started there, I was in a really bad place with my depression and my anxiety, and I just wasn't doing well. Um, I didn't want to be in therapy. I wasn't ready to work through any of my issues. Um, I just didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to talk to anyone about it. Um, so being in therapy wasn't really doing anything. Um, but my mom forced me to go, so I did. Um, after a little bit of that, I was just I just kept getting worse and I got into harder drugs and just kept making worse and worse decisions. Um, my relationship with my mom just wasn't doing well. We were just arguing all the time and that was that wasn't good for me or either of us. Uh, so uh, all of that led to me having a suicide attempt, which I was hospitalized for for a little bit. Um, and after that, I came out of it and I realized that I didn't want to be depressed anymore. I wanted to try in therapy and I wanted to make the effort to be better and to be happy. And 
I realized that I didn't want to just sit there like a shell of a human in a therapy session and just have someone talk at me for 50 minutes and just leave and be like, oh, I went to therapy, so I'm doing the work. You have to be present to make changes in yourself. And I learned that the hard way, but I learned it. So, um, so after that, after working in therapy and like deciding that I wanted to do the work and put in the effort, I um, got in touch with my current therapist, Brittany, um, who really helped me get to where I am today. And um, she was able to guide me in directions just whenever I was spewing whatever. And she was like, oh, just maybe, maybe it's this, maybe it's this. And she was just really helpful. And I think we have a really good connection. Um, and I think that paired with me getting on the right medication for me, which was a little tricky at first, but everybody gets there. Um, I think once I got those two together and I decided that I didn't want to be depressed anymore, um, I was able to make the change uh, and pull myself out of that. Um, and yeah, so uh, today I'm a college student uh, at Brockport. And um, I got on Dean's List with honors last semester, and I'm currently in an NA group. Um, my relationship with my mom is better than it's ever been, and I'm also in a really healthy relationship um, with my partner. And um, I'm doing really well. Um, I want to graduate from here, hopefully, eventually. Um, and I want to go to grad school to um, help younger kids uh, that were in similar situations that I was in. Um, I think I can have some insight to that uh, to help, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, so, thank you. Great. Thank you, Kendall. We're so grateful that she was willing to share her story, and we're so proud of her and her accomplishments. Um, Dean's List, that's awesome. We're so proud of her. Um, throughout the pandemic, um, but especially over the past year, we've seen a significant increase in kids being referred to us for services early in, earlier in the trajectory of their symptoms. There's been a lot of focus on children's mental health um, in the pandemic in our community. Um, we found that with this increased awareness, there's maybe been a little bit less stigma around it. There's been a lot of local news stories um, following some of the districts and some families. So we've been seeing a lot of uh, referrals from families and individuals at schools for kids um, showing up a little bit early in their trajectory with some less severe symptoms than we've we've seen in the past, which is great. Um, before COVID-19, only about 5% of the kids we saw here at Helio um, were identified as being new to mental health treatment. So most of the kids that came through our doors had had some previous treatment experience. Past, the past year, 2021, um, with the increase in kids that we saw, about 60% of the kids that we saw for services had no previous mental health diagnosis. So um, this has been a fairly new trend just over the past year that we've been seeing here at the clinic. We've also seen an increase in LGBTQ plus youth presenting with mental health symptoms. Um, so this has become more of a focus for us in the treatment that we're providing um, to our student, to our kids. This often incorporates a lot of family work, um, sometimes gradually based on how receptive the family is to um, discussing these issues with us. Um, but we're doing a lot of community connection, um, connecting the kids with supports in the uh, different organizations in the community and within their schools. Our clinicians are really able to be a supportive bridge between the client that we're we're working with and the systems that that client is interacting with, um, particularly the schools. And you'll see here just kind of a breakdown of, of where the kids are that we're serving. Um, we're primarily located here in Onondaga County, so majority of our kids um, are from the county, and the demographics do um, mirror what the community um, that we serve um, does look like. Next slide. And again, just a visual representation of that community we serve, um, and, and those bubbles are primarily around Onondaga County. We serve the six county region um, around us, but we certainly see kids um, from other areas as well. And as you do move west from us and around the state, there are other CCB, CH, CCBHCs in those regions that serve those kids as well. Next slide. And again, as Sheila talked about earlier on in the presentation, um, evidence-based practices is a huge part of, of our CCBHC. So here listed are um, the various evidence-based practices that we're 
that we're utilizing in our clinic. Um, early on, we did an initiative with the county for the child parent psychotherapy um, and trained all of our clinicians in that. Um, we currently have some staff involved um, in a DBT training collaborative for both um, intensive and skills training that's going on with our BHCC, which is fantastic. Um, and we also have an in-house motivational interviewing trainer, and we have free monthly um, motivational interviewing coaching and supervision for all of the clinicians at Helio Health. Next slide. And the CCBHC has really allowed us to have a truly multidisciplinary approach to patient care. The comprehensive CCBHC model coupled with the PPS rate that we were able to get as a CCBHC allowed us to competitively recruit for board certified child and adolescent psychiatrists and other professional staff. So currently we have one full-time and one part-time child psychiatrist, which is amazing. Um, we were really concerned about the workforce shortage in this region. Um, and we were, we were just so proud um, that we were able to get those um, you know, expertise here on our team. We also have um, a nurse practitioner of psychiatry who works with our, our, student, our, our kids, um, a registered nurse who supports the providers and works with the children on their physical health screening and referrals. Um, we also have 12 clinicians that are working out of our main CCBHC, and we have a great mix um, of social workers, licensed mental health counselors, licensed creative arts therapists, music therapists. So we're really able to provide um, a, a great array of services to the kids that we work with. And as a CCBHC, we're also an integrated mental health and substance use clinic. So we have a KSAC on staff. It's also able to work with some of our kids that are having the, the substance abuse and mental health issues. And again, we talked a bit about our psych rehab special um, who is often working in the community with kids and their families in their homes or at school. And a family peer advocate, um, we do have a family peer advocate position on our team. We have had a challenge, again, that's been a position in this area. We've had a challenge um, filling, but we do have staff that do work with us on the team that do have lived experience with kids that have been involved in the mental health system. So we do have that voice um, from some staff that fulfill other roles with our organizations. And with our school-based team, um, we have nine clinicians that are working over those 18 schools, and we have a team leader that helps to support them um, and really foster those relationships with the schools. Next slide. And Sheila again talked about the uh, importance of community collaboration. So she had her grid with kind of the different um, entities in the community. We do a lot of that work with the juvenile justice system, child protective services, the schools. Um, we work with a lot of local primary care offices, pediatricians, hospitals. So we have a lot of those um, collaborations in place now. Um, we work with that with our county and their uh, mental, child mental health system. And even preparing for this um, presentation today, I had a great conversation with um, our local county access team and system of care manager about um, this presentation, but also how we could continue to collaborate and work better together. So um, even just getting ready for this presentation prompted some really great conversation and um, plans for future collaboration. So um, we really look forward to continuing to work with our community and serve the kids the best that we can. And um, we appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, and I, I think what we'll do now, that was really helpful. And I think we'll um, kind of bring um, Donna and Sarah into this discussion to kind of talk about the role of the state in supporting customization for children and youth at the CCBHC level. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sheila. I'll, I'll jump in. Hi, everybody. Donna Bradbury. I serve as Associate Commissioner here at the New York State Office of Mental Health. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And um, it's been a pleasure to listen to uh, Lisa talk about um, their successes. And, I, and um, you know, I think in terms of the larger environment here in New York State and the efforts that we've taken really over decades to um, customize approaches to children's behavioral health services. It really does go back many, many years. And we have a, this long and rich history um, statewide uh, creating an environment that's really conducive to cross-system collaboration, which um, for people that are, have historically been in kids' mental health services know is really essential to, to delivering effective services. Our history really dates back to way back to the 1980s, right? With for people that might remember the CASP principles, which really were a precursor to SAMHSA's system of care approach. 
And since then, um, and particularly since uh, about 1999, when um, local uh, system of care grants were made available, um, since 1999, I think we've had in excess of 17 of those awards within New York State into various counties. Um, and two of those recent awards have been to the New York State Office of, Office of Mental Health, which we've um, utilized to do two things. Um, first, we've been testing high fidelity wraparound within a health home environment. And you heard Sheila talk earlier about um, the multiple reforms that have been going on across uh, the nation in terms of kids um, services and one of them being Medicaid reforms and the implementation of health homes. And so we've taken that work very seriously and um, combined our Medicaid reform work with our system of care approach. And so currently we're, we're testing how high fidelity works within a health home environment. Um, the other thing that we're using our system of care grant for is just uh, uh, expansion and enhancement of the adoption of system of care values. And that has a lot to do with how providers like Helio can be successful um, in terms of uh, appropriately and effectively meeting the needs of uh, the children, youth, and families that they that they serve. Um, the the other um, uh, uh, thing that I want to mention is specific to the Medicaid reforms that we've made over the past five to six years. Um, really dramatic. Um, enhancements to the children's behavioral health system that were achieved, by the way, um, with very strong commitment across sectors and across state agencies. So our Department of Health, which is our Medicaid authority, uh, obviously the Office of Mental Health, our Substance Use Authority, our Ch Child Welfare Authority, and then at a later point in time, um, our Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities joined that effort as well. And so a really a true um, cross-system uh, effort to make these reforms to Medicaid services, which ultimately resulted in health homes that are customized for children. Um, we added six new Medicaid estate plan services to enhance the service array and make services more broadly available to children uh, much sooner in their trajectory. Um, and we aligned um, multiple home and community-based services um, waivers into a single child uh, serving um, sort of a no wrong door approach, if you will. So regardless of which system children um, entered in, they could access the home and community-based services that they need. And so all of that, the system of care work, the Medicaid reforms, and uh, all the other for reforms uh, that are afoot on the child welfare side and the juvenile justice side, right, um, are um, encouraging and supporting um, this cross-agency collaboration that creates a, a ultimately statewide um, a very um, uh, supportive environment that helps providers at the local level really to deliver services that are aligned with all the system of care values that you hear reiterated in the, the, um, the approach of a CCBHC, right? That services are really driven by uh, families and youth, that uh, we strive to deliver the, the, the care in the least restrictive setting, right? That services are culturally appropriate and humble. Um, so uh, all of that to say, um, and I, I should mention too, that Helio has the benefit of being based in um, a county and a, and a region that's particularly strong and committed to these approaches. So I think it shows um, in their commitment and uh, in their results. Um, I hope that helps. I'm gonna turn to Sarah uh, to say a few words about I think some of the initial results that we're seeing out of the CCPHC demonstration here in New York. Sarah? Thanks so much, Donna. I'll be pretty brief. I wanted to uh, thank, echo Donna and thanking Lisa and Helio and particularly thanking Kendall, hopefully the, um, the highlight of the webinar for sure. 
So, so just echoing Donna and saying that, you know, this is one tool um, among many tools that New York State is bringing to bear in the customization of care for children and families. We, we do see CCDHCs um, as particularly able to be effective um, in wrapping around care because of the menu of services, because of the opportunities with reimbursement, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that I would note, as, as Lisa mentioned, is that um, uh, Helio, like some of our other demonstration um, CCDHCs, um, had not previously served children. Um, and yet the, the uptake is very notable. Um, and, uh, and we really think that that's due to the CCDHC model um, being, being family-based and being ready and being flexible um, to, to be serving children. And, and so, so we all know that um, some, of, some of these services uh, that haven't necessarily served children historically, it can take a little while to get up to speed. So across, uh, it, it, so it was of interest to us to dig in a little bit to see what the numbers look like. So New York has 13 demonstration CCBHCs. They do all serve children. We're in demonstration year three. I mean, at this point, more than 20% of individuals served in CCBHCs are zero to 17. That's about 12K kids unduplicated in New York State. Um, and again, considering that for um, some of these uh, providers and sites that's going from zero uh, in a pandemic, keeping kids and families engaged, um, we think that's pretty notable and the trend is going up. Um, and, and we do also see that um, many children are served in that family system where family, where their parents are seen as well, um, which we think contributes to uh, that engagement and that growth. Um, I'll, I will point out, as Lisa mentioned, and I know it came up in the Q&A and the chat a little bit too, you know, two of the pro provider types um, that we have a keen interest in in New York State in, uh, in terms of workforce are child and adolescent prescribers. Um, as well as family peer advocates and youth peer advocates. And so um, in both of those categories, uh, Lisa showed as an example, the commitment um, from Helio and from CCBHCs, um, but also the capacity to be able to recruit uh, when, when it may be challenging. And so, you know, um, the, we, have, we have workforce shortages in these areas, um, but year, year over year, CCBHCs have grown um, statewide in terms of FTEs in uh, child and adolescent providers and in family peer and youth care advocates, which is, which is really, I think, notable in this current climate. Um, we uh, also, Lisa mentioned this, um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, which I, which I think is really promising. Uh, we in New York State and across the country are engaged in a, in a very deep conversation about school-based mental health. Um, we really know that this is where things have to move for kids, to meet kids where they're at. Um, we, we have about 1,000 school-based mental health clinics in New York State. Um, and in the, uh, in the demonstration years, um, over 70 of those are actually um, with CCDHC. Um, and 19 of those, I believe, are with, with Helio. Uh, and again, I think the capacity and the flexibility of the CCDHC not only has allowed um, quick uh, uptake of that model, but also a great flexibility in recruiting and then being able to plug the child and the family back into the main site services, which I do think makes a, a real difference in terms of keeping uh, children and families engaged. So that's an area that we hope to continue targeting for growth. So I'll pause there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah and Donna. That was really a nice kind of you know, overview from the state perspective. Um, and I think we are going to maybe transition to a couple of questions while we have some time. Um, so, so I can hop in here, Sheila, because I've been monitoring the questions coming in. Um, so there's a few things I'm trying to prioritize accordingly. One of the recent questions uh, that came in that I think is important for just context and grounding, which I believe was intended for Lisa, but I would actually love to hear from Donna and Sarah's perspective on this as well, was can you comment on how the overarching principles and structures that Sheila talked about intersect with the clinical work of your CCDHC? 
So how are we drawing those lines between, um, you know, those, you know, child serving system best practices with the elements of your CCDHC scope of services? I think from the, from the clinic perspective, I think it's having, you know, staff that are, you know, and, and people like myself and other leaders in the organization really working closely with um, the New York State Office of Mental Health and some of these other um, providers in the community, the juvenile justice system, our county LGU, um, making sure that we're staying up on, you know, current policies and legislation and just, you know, best practices so that we can, you know, folks like myself and others can kind of bring back to the organization what's happening um, larger statewide wide nationally so that we can make sure we're staying on top of those um, best practices that are happening and providing the appropriate training and guidance to our team that are on the ground and, and really doing this day-to-day -day work um, in the community, interacting with the kids and the families and, you know, the other providers in the region. I think from the state perspective, there's just a huge amount of synergy in clinical best practices the CCDHC model and the system of care, right? All of them are, are deeply fundamentally rooted in the idea of the importance of collaboration, communication. Um, and, and so I think that because of that, it's it's been maybe even easier in the CCDHC setting than other settings because the values are very consistent. Like Don, Donna talked about, um, this is a region of the state that is deeply invested in system of care. And I think that that's why CCDHC sit, sits very cleanly in that system. Um, and then clinical best practices for children and families are all about integration. Uh, and so, so for us, we really experienced it as across those three pillars, um, the, the foundation is the same. And so, so it works. Great. Um, the next question, you know, we're in the midst of a crisis in workforce, right? So one of the first questions that bubbled up, Lisa, was since you weren't a provider of children's services prior to your CCDHC, how did you go about recruiting a child provider, a psychiatrist or psych APN? And I know you talked a little bit about that staffing model, mm -hmm. and I know that was a while ago, um, but I imagine there's still a lot of work you're doing in this space to bolster your workforce. Yeah, I think we're, you know, we're very intentional about our relationships in the community. Um, you know, we have a very close relationship with, I, I talked about earlier with Upstate Medical University. Um, they have a department of psychiatry there. Um, they have, we are also a site for um, uh, psychiatry fellows to come through. So one of the child psychiatrists we were able to recruit actually came through um, as an addiction psychiatry fellow and his other um, specialty was in child and adolescent psychiatry. So he just loved his experience with us and stayed on board. Um, and the other, another provider was to, again through our relationship with Upstate. Um, somebody who was well respected in the community, and they helped to facilitate those connections. And he started part time when we first opened, and we were much smaller. And over time, as we grew, and he enjoyed his experience here, um, he increased his hours and is now full time. Um, and and um, through his recommendations, we added a second part time person. So um, we've really just built some great relationships in the community and um, word of mouth. And I'll say at the organization, we really, really value our providers' input. Um, so we do a lot of quality improvement work where our uh, psychiatrist is leading the way um, to kind of help us figure out how we can improve services for the kids and families that we serve. Great. Um, and that's, we're hearing similar tactics amongst other clinics when we're constantly talking about workforce right now. Um, Sheila, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, the state and local systems of care experience with uh, deeper end service needs such as treatment beds or inpatient psychiatric services as they develop a robust community-based service array. Well, the we still have a lot of children that are in residential and psych residential treatment facilities staying too long um, and children bouncing in and out of psych hospital beds. And it's typically because of the lack of home and community-based services. So if families don't have access to in-home crisis supports, to respite, to peer support, to intensive in-home services, um, then by default, people are going to um, send children to more restrictive services. And so 
the trend among children's systems and nationally in terms of federal policy has been to build the capacity for home and community-based services and earlier intervention. We even have some states now, Massachusetts and California, for example, that are allowing Medicaid children and eligible children to access certain behavioral health services without a diagnosis. Um, because often um, clinicians and families that may be reluctant to give a child a diagnosis, it's not really clear what's going on, but something is, and there needs to be service provision. Children in child welfare, for example, often don't come in with a mental health diagnosis, but have suffered severe trauma. So there's really a move more toward, and has been for some time, of home and community-based services. And, you know, when we deinstitutionalized um, psych inpatient hospitals, it, the, the, the promise of building robust home and community-based service capacity was never really fulfilled. And I think that's where CHCBA, CCBCA, CCBHCs and other providers can really play critical roles. So, and not that obviously hospital beds in residential treatment are still needed in a continuum, but we rely on them too often because home and community-based services are not in place. Uh, and I think that this team's presentation is such a huge representation of what can happen when you focus more downstream on prevention. All right, we only have a few minutes left. Um, so I'm going to ask each of my um, co-presenters to just give us any last reflections they might have, um, but maybe to give you a moment to gather your thoughts. One thing I also want to find that stuck out to me today is we often talk about how important language is. Um, so as we go into this learning community, I just want to be grounding us in language, particularly around care coordination, um, because we're talking about that in two different ways um, and want to make sure people are thinking about it with the right lens, right? There is care coordination, which is part of the CCBHC requirements. Um, and that focuses on the required partnerships and team-based approaches to coordinating whole person care for CCDHC clients as large. And then within this learning community, what we're really going to be talking about quite frequently and more specifically is around that intensive care coordination, such as wraparound service array within the child serving system. So I want to put that in everyone's minds moving forward. So we're not getting them swapped sometimes. Um, and we actually have a webinar in this learning community in July that's particularly just focused on care coordination and wraparound. Um, within the child serving system. So wanting to make sure we're all wearing the right hats as we walk into this. Um, and with that, I will turn it over if anyone has any last thoughts or insights they wanna share. Well, I would first ask our New York folks if they wanna have any comments or something you wanna add. I'll, this is Donna, I'll just say, uh, in real estate, the mantra is location, location, location. In children's mental health, the mantra is relationships, relationships, relationships. It's all relationships. So form relationships with the children, families that you serve, form relationships with your cross systems partners uh, and you will do well. Thank you. I will say that, um, you know, we've been really, really pleased with uh, the opportunities for children and families with CCPHC, we think that there's significant room to grow as well. Um, with Helio and with all of them, uh, with, with all our demonstration and expansion CCPHCs, we really think that there are opportunities, particularly kind of carry pandemic, post pandemic, CCPHCs really offer an opportunity to be able to meet some of the, um, the new needs and the exacerbated needs. So, so New York State is excited about that. Thank you. 
And just to piggyback on Sarah's comment, um, you know, coming from, you know, working in the CCBHC model, um, I, I think what makes the CCBHC model so successful um, is our ability to provide, you know, that array of services that I talked about, that menu of services that can really support the kids and their families um, in the community. Um, and, and that is the second piece is that we're able to serve them in the community. So, uh, you know, we're intended to provide services outside of our four walls. Um, and I think being able to meet the kids and their families where they're at with that array of services um, has, is what has made this very successful. And I, I would just say that the that there will be other webinars and sessions in this learning community um, that focus more in depth on some of the areas that I just touched upon. So stay tuned. Thank you for joining this month's Child and Family Focus Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics Learning Community, hosted by the CCBHC Expansion Grantee National Training and Technical Assistance Center. Please take a few moments to complete the evaluation for this workshop using the following link being posted in the chat. We will be providing a certificate of attendance for completion of each workshop being offered throughout the entire series. So make sure you're registered with the same name logged into each webinar so that we can confirm your attendance and the total time you were part of this workshop. Please allow up to 10 business days for your certificate of attendance to become available and ideas at the Institute. Any presentations, resources, and webinar recordings will be made available to you within Ideas at the Institute. Once you are registered for the learning community, you will have access to all the upcoming and previously recorded webinars. With our goal to support increased access to and improve quality of CCBHCs in meeting the needs of youth and families, we hope you join us again next month on April 11th, 2022 for session two, Mobile Response and Stabilization Services, an essential support for youth and families. You can access the Zoom link for each workshop and download a calendar appointment for that workshop by logging into Ideas at the Institute. Access the CCBHC Learning Community Curriculum and click the View button for the upcoming webinar. I hope that today's session has provided you with greater understanding of the value of children's services and the role of child serving systems as you continue to identify and implement approaches to meet the unique needs of children, youth, and young adults with behavioral health needs and their families. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at the next workshop.